Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Bible study. So it's 7 p.m. Let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Father, we thank you once again for bringing us even remotely, to this scripture study or this Bible study. We ask you to enlighten our minds, to touch our hearts, so that more and more we may follow God and follow His Word in our lives. And today, as we remember Our Lady of Fatima, we ask for her, for her continued intercession for all of us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, we are now in chapter 8. In Acts, the book of Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 8. So I think we tackled uh, the first few verses of chapter 8 wherein we saw the effect of the persecution or the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution of Christians or the persecution of the church of Jerusalem. So, you know, one thing that we could learn here is that instead of making them stop because of the persecution, the word of God kept spreading. So instead of hiding, instead of uh, keeping the good news to themselves, to keep themselves safe, because of the persecution, the people, uh, the church, went to the countryside in Judea, in Samaria, and they started to proclaim the good news there. So from Jerusalem, remember the, the outline that we have or um, the instruction that the good news will spread from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we now proceed to Judea and Samaria. So let's continue. So again, as I've said, instead of going hiding, 
with the martyrdom of Stephen, the church scattered. The more the church scattered. The more the church is persecuted, the more the church spreads. Now, let's go to the mission in Judea and Samaria. So that is chapter 8, verses 4 and the following. So let us look into this passage or this uh, chapter. Now those who had been scattered went about preaching the word of God. So those who went, those who were scattered, what did they do? They went about preaching. And one of them was Philip. Remember Philip, one of the seven deacons, one of those who were chosen as a, a deacon. So they went to preach the word of God. Thus Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. With one accord, the crowds paid attention to what was said by Philip when they heard it and saw the signs he was doing. For unclean spirits, crying out in a loud voice, come out of many possessed people and many paralyzed and crippled people were cured. There was great joy in that city. Um, okay. So first, let us look at what Philip, first, let us look at the city of Samaria. We have to remember that the city of Samaria is like the, how do you call that? The opposing city against Jerusalem. And that is the place of the Samaritans. And we know the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. They are like enemies, no? and if, if the term is right. They are like always in conflict. Why? Because this is, you know, from, from the division of the, from Israel into northern and southern kingdom. And when they, when the north and separated from the south, uh, when they separated, the temple where the Jews were supposed to worship were in the south. And those people in uh, the north could not go to the south to worship in the temple. So they had, uh, uh, they built their own temples in Jerusalem, And that is also in Samaria, the, the, in the area of Samaria. And Samaria was considered one of the, uh, or the capital of the northern kingdom, if I'm not mistaken. So you, you see there that, that uh, division between the two. And if you remember, also, what was the attitude of the Samaritans toward the Jews? Remember when Jesus was uh, passing by um, the Samaritan village in Luke chapter 9? Uh, they would not welcome him because the destination of Jesus was Jerusalem. So you see here the conflict. We see here the conflict. But... What happened here? So um, Philip went to Samaria and he preached. Aside from preaching, he uh, showed some signs, meaning um, he was driving out unclean spirits. There were, um, how do you call that, uh, um, exorcisms, and at the same time healing healing the paralyzed and the crippled man. So again, you see how the good news is being preached by words and by deeds, by words and by action. You know, many times we say, oh, uh, uh, I just keep quiet. I just do what I can because I don't know what to say. Well, that's one part of it. However, we should also learn how to speak out the gospel to share the good news to others. And it also cannot be that we just talk and talk without the deeds, without the action. So the good news is always um, spread through words and action. Okay. So, um, so as he preached there, they... Uh, there, let, let's just skip that portion from 9 to 11. Let's go to now verse 12. But once they began to believe, Philip 
as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, men and women alike were baptized. Okay. So, and then uh, we'll skip verse 13. We'll go back to that. So verse 12, then verse 14. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John who went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit for it had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had only, had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So what do we see here? Uh, Peter and John, this, they are two apostles. Uh, they saw a new development, right? They were in Jerusalem and they heard about it. So they wanted to check. They wanted to see what's happening in Samaria because this is the first time that non-Jews, okay? Um, these are, you know, the Samaritans. They are like mixed Jews and with another national, not pure Jews. Okay, and they are being baptized into the family of the faith. And so when they went there, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now we see here the distinction between what Philip did, baptize. But what did the two apostles do? Give the Holy Spirit. So what do we see here in, the, in our church practice today? Baptism and confirmation, okay? Because they say the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon them yet. And there was this distinction that um, when the apostles came, Peter and John, they called down the Spirit, okay? And this Spirit is manifested through visible and charismatic way. Um. So, excuse me. No comments. Wait, there is a little technical issue here. No comments, not running. Okay. Uh, could somebody say that if whether you still see me? Could somebody just tell me if I'm still on? Because something appeared on the screen which I could not take away. Well, I hope I'm still on with everybody and you still see my face. I don't have, I, I, how could I check with my... Uh, uh, who's here? Uh, um. Okay, we can see and hear you. Thank you. Okay, I'll just continue. Okay, thank you. So, um, where, where was I? So, um, maybe it, it's nice to give a little catechism. You know, in baptism, we already receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's not that you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. But in confirmation, we receive the laying on of hands and receive certain manifestations of the gifts. So the so in, in, in baptism we receive the Holy Spirit. We don't see the Holy Spirit. It's invisible. But the um in in confirmation the spirit is manifested through visible signs and at times in charismatic ways. So this is where the tradition of our church um that we practice even today that when we baptize the infants, um, later on, we invite a bishop to confirm them, to, to lay the hands on them, 
so that they receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I hope you see where this tradition of uh, baptism and confirmation uh, is rooted in scriptures. So, okay, now, so that is uh, how Philip started to spread the faith in Samaria. And as I've said, oh, that's good. Now the screen is okay. Now, um, so, um, as I've said, compared to how they treated Jesus, that they were not welcoming, now they now welcome the good news. Okay, so we see that they became enthusiastic. They were enthusiastic to receive the word of God. Okay, now let's look into Simon the Magician. Let's go back to verse 9. Okay, there was a man named Simon who used to practice magic in the city and astounded the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. Okay, all of them from the least to the greatest paid attention to him, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. Okay, so they paid attention to him because he had astounded them by his magic for a long time. Now, let's jump to verse 13. Even Simon himself believed and after being baptized, became devoted to Philip. And when he saw the signs and mighty deeds that were occurring, he was astounded. So, okay, let's first look at Simon. Now, he was using magic. What is magic here? Okay, it could be, we can say, uh, it is an occult, something that is hidden, uses supernatural powers to do this and that, okay? Um, why, why such incident? Why, why, why did Luke, uh, the writer of this uh, uh, book, gave this incident? Because Luke would like to show us the difference between magic and the um how do you call that the works of the holy spirit okay so it is not the same okay now just to let you know simon um simon here the magician is also known as the father of heretics because you know his teachings when it reached rome they honored him and erected a erected a uh, statue in honor of him with the inscription uh, to Simon the Holy God. Okay? So he is actually the father of Gnosticism. That is one heresy, one wrong belief in the church or one that does not go with the teachings of the church. So he was known to perform magic okay now um what when 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 simon saw the holy spirit when the, when simon saw the apostles peter and john okay and uh, when when he saw also the mighty deeds done by by philip oh he wanted to have that power also so when Simon saw that the Spirit, verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was conferred by the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me this power too, so that anyone upon whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So what is he trying to do? He's trying to buy spiritual powers. That is why we have today what we call simony. Right in our catechism, simony means uh, you are. It's the it's a sin. Okay, first it's a sin against uh, buying and uh, selling of spiritual things. Okay, um, it is impossible to appropriate to oneself spiritual goods and behave toward them as their owner or master. For they have their source in God. One can receive them only from him without payment. 
okay? When you are given certain spiritual powers or spiritual gift, all this comes from God. You cannot be like the master or the owner of that power because all this had been granted to God. So what, what Simon wanted to happen was that he wanted to have it for himself, you know, to perform also such, to be able to perform also such miracles, which is for his personal gain. So that's why when he, when he uh, asked, okay, to have that power too, um, and he offered money to pay for it, what did Peter say? Verse 20. Peter said to him, May your money perish with you because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no uh, share or lot in this matter for your heart is not upright before God. And so repent of the wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible your intention may be forgiven. For I see that you are filled with bitter gall and are in the bonds of iniquity. Simon said in reply, so Simon asked, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Okay? So that is about Simon. Uh, now we know where the word simony came from. Okay? Which is a uh, violation against the first commandment of God and also the occult practices or magic or divinization are all against the um, first command, are, are, are all against the first commandment of God. Okay, so let's continue and see how, how the word of God uh, continued to spread. So, so verse 25, so when they had testified and proclaimed the word of God, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the good news to many Samaritan villages. Now let's look into Philip and the Ethiopian uh, eunuch. Verse 26, then the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, get up and head south on the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza and the desert route. Okay, So he got up and set out. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Kandache. Okay, just to give a little background. Uh, first, the angel of the Lord appeared to tell Philip where to go. So we see here what I have been telling you from the very start. The spread of the good news is not just any human endeavor. All this is directed by God. It is directed by the Lord, okay? It spreads not just by human decision or endeavor. So the angel was directing and guiding uh, Philip to go to to go from Jerusalem to that place of Gaza. Okay, now he met this eunuch. This is a court official. Uh, according to the reading, he is a treasurer. Okay, that is the queen of the Ethiopians in charge of her entire treasury who had come to Jerusalem to worship. So, um, Kandache is a name or a title of the queen mother of the royal matriarch of Ethiopia. Okay, so this is in uh, Ethiopia. So they came to Jerusalem to worship. So you see that time Judaism was admired, not just by the Jews in Israel, but it has spread into different places. Okay, it has uh, spread also to different nationalities in the ancient world. So remember, the kingdom of David in the Old Testament is not just a, a local national kingdom. It is meant to be international. It spread. Okay. So there were uh, from other nationalities who have heard of this, uh, of, 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 of the Jews, of the, of the God of the Jews, the God of Israelites, and they come to worship. And one of them is this uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And so he was already returning home from the worship. So verse 28, seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, again, guided by the, by the spirit, 
Go and join up with that chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone instructs me? So he invited Philip to get in and sit with him. Okay, let's just pause for a while here. No, it's a nice uh, comment from this uh, Ethiopian uh, eunuch. Uh, how can I unless someone instructs me? I know many of us loves to read the Bible, right? And many of us uh, tend to read it and interpret it on our own. That is the problem. When we do not uh, base our interpretations and understanding of scriptures according to church teachings, then that is where you know misunderstanding and misinterpretations come in. And you know that is where misunderstanding. And, uh, you know, we, you start protesting how come the Bible says this and the church is teaching this and that. Because many parts of the gospel, many parts of the scripture, at times we just read plainly. There are different ways of interpreting. And so it is always good to attend like this Bible study to enlighten us more and at the same time um, to guide us in a proper interpretation or choose good books of interpretation so but for the books you also have to choose because we have uh, protestant writers which at times are good but it depends uh, from where they are taking their sources but um, for for us catholics we try to look into the church teaching the magisterium the church fathers the early church fathers uh, who handed, who were the first witnesses of this, uh, who, were, who were, we could say, uh, companions of the apostles. They were the ones who were interpreting. And so we base our explanations through their, ex, through their you know, base our understanding through their explanations. So, um, and our, a lot of our church teachings are also based there. So anyway, and that, that's just a side note of the importance of not just reading the Bible on your own, okay? But uh, having somebody to help you and guide you to interpret it. Now, okay, let's continue. So, verse 32. This was the scripture passage he was reading. It's taken from Isaiah, from the suffering servant's song. That is Isaiah 52 and 53. Okay. So, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And as a lamb, before its shearer is, is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will tell of his posterity? For his life is taken from the earth. Okay. So, um, the then the eunuch said to Philip in reply, I beg you about whom is the prophet saying this? about himself or someone else so the question is after reading this passage from isaiah which is a prophecy regarding the suffering servant and this is pointing to jesus as the suffering servant it pointed to the rejection the humiliation uh the murder of the messiah okay by his own people by his own generation okay and um and Jesus, as the suffering servant, okay, this servant, pours out his life willingly as a sacrifice for human sin. That is what this passage is saying. Okay, all this is taken from Isaiah. So the Ethiopian wanted to know who, who does this refer to? And that was an opening for Philip to tell him. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture passage, he proclaimed Jesus to him. Okay, you, so we see here, again, the connection of the Old Testament to Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the, of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Okay, then Philip opened his mouth and opened the scriptures. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Let, Look, there is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? Then he ordered the chariot to stop, and Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water, and he baptized him. 
When they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but continued on his way rejoicing. Philip came to Azotus and went about proclaiming the good news to all the towns until he reached um, Caesarea. Okay, now, mm, let me... Um, First, let us, let us recall, the Ethiopian eunuch, being a eunuch, he, in the Old Covenant, in, if he, in the Old Testament, he could not, though he may be, you know, believing in the God of Israel, but because he is a Gentile, he could not be circumcised because he had been, he's a eunuch, you know, he has been castrated. So, and... Part of the law uh, of the Old Testament is that they could not even step into the temple to offer sacrifice to, to offer sacrifices to worship God. Okay, so even though he may be a believer of the God of Israel, he could not be in communion. We would say he could not be. Uh, part of or be a member of the people of Israel. Okay? So there is this restriction. But Philip realized here um, and he was uh, um, and, and he realized here that this restriction had been lifted. Okay? In the new messianic age in the age of jesus this restriction that renders this gentile this or this this eunuch to to uh uh to to not be part of the of the people of god right so they he, this was lifted in the new covenant in Jesus Christ. So, what can we see here as uh, as things that we can reflect on? Oh, by the way, uh, just one point here. Um, it's written here: the eunuchs, the eunuch uh, continued on his way rejoicing, and um, it is known that he is the first Christian to evangelize Ethiopia. Okay, to, to share the faith in Ethiopia. Now, some learning, some reflections from this event. Um, as I mentioned a while ago, the work of God is always guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's why we continue to pray for the Holy Spirit in this work of our, of our evangelization even until today. Second point that we can learn from here, the need for uh, for the scriptures to be explained. Okay? In our reading of scriptures, it will always be good that somebody explains it. Like, remember in the, uh, um, the two disciples in Emmaus, the scripture was slowly, slowly unveiled before them. Okay? And Isaiah 56 prophesied that one day the Lord's house will be open to all. Okay, so this is the lesson that we learn from this, that even eunuchs who were disqualified in the assembly of God, okay, even eunuchs that were uh, in the Old Testament not allowed to be part of the of the um, of the people of God, now it's open to all. Okay, and finally another point of reflection is this: when he received the Lord. He was filled with joy. Do we still have the joy? Do we still have that joy in our hearts because we have God in us? Or, you know, at times I feel, you know, some people think that having Jesus is a burden. You have to attend Mass. You have to follow the commandments. You know, you cannot do this. You cannot do that. So at times, I, I, I just could feel that at times people think our faith, gives us a certain burden. But you know, 
Receiving Jesus in our lives brings joy. Brings joy. Okay, so um, these are some points for reflection that we could get from this experience of Philip and the Ethiopian. Also, now, mm, um, so Philip, at the last verse, came to Azotus and went about proclaiming the good news to all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Caesarea during that time is the capital of the Roman capital of Judea. Okay, so remember I was telling you that the faith spread from Jerusalem to Judea. So Caesarea is the capital of Judea. Now let's go to chapter 9. This is a very interesting uh, chapter. This is about the conversion of soul. The conversion of soul. Now, I believe all of us know and are familiar with this. And let us just go through it because it's always nice to hear what happened to soul. Uh, chapter 9. Now Saul, still breathing murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus that if he should find any men and women belong to the way, he might bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. Okay, so Saul first was a Pharisee. He is a student of Gamaliel, one of the most famous rabbi. So he knew he is a very dedicated Jewish Jew, Pharisee, okay, teacher of the law. And he is so, you know, and uh, how do you call that? So determined that he even asked for arrest warrants from the high priest so that if he should see anyone, if he should meet anyone, any Jew, who has converted to follow the way, the way here is referring to the believers. That is how they called themselves in the beginning, those who followed the way. Okay? Uh, remember um, St. John the Baptist, okay, was saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Okay? The way. A new way, and because this is this is uh, it pictures the new exodus, the way from sin to salvation. So that is what we call a code name for Christian for the Christian movement, the way. So anybody who is a believer who follows the way, he will arrest them, chain them, and drag them back to Jerusalem so that they could face the court the high court in, in, the San, in the Sanhedrin, okay, so that they could face trial in the court. So that's the idea of Paul, okay? Now, on his journey, as he was nearing Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Soul, soul, why are you persecuting my followers? No, 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 he did not say that. What did, he, what, what did he hear? Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? Okay? Why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, sir? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, for they heard the voice, but could not could see no one. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. For three days he was unable to see, and he neither ate nor drank. Okay, what happened to Saul? A bright light came. And it blinded him. And the voice was heard. Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? So, and then he, when he asked, who are you? They said, and the voice said, I am Jesus, whom you are 
persecuting. What do we see immediately here? The connection, the oneness of Christ and his believers, the church. That's why we call ourselves the body of Christ. That once you attack the church, you are attacking Christ. When you attack Christ, you attack the church. We see here the unity of Christ and his church. Okay. The light that's shown is the glory of Jesus. Okay. That blinded soul. And then the reverse happened. Why did I say that? Saul was intending to arrest and, you know, haul the Christians uh, as prisoners from Damascus. But this time, he, Saul, became a captive of Christ. And he became helpless, right? Because he was blind. And he was uh, held in the hand and brought to Damascus. So you see the reverse happened. Well, his plan was to arrest the Christians, those who followed the way, and chain them, bring them back to Jerusalem. We see here Jesus capturing Saul. Okay? And this time, Saul was the one helpless, okay, who needed somebody to hold his hand to bring him into the city. Okay. So we see here um, that incident. And so for three days, he was unable to see and neither ate nor drink. So three days, he was fasting. Okay, the soul's baptism. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and ask at the house of Judas for a man for a man from Tarsus. Um, named Saul, a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is there praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him that he may regain his sight. So Saul was praying. Okay? Remember, he was a Jew. He prayed. Okay, In that prayer, he had a vision. And that vision was that he saw a man, Ananias, named Ananias, who will lay his hand on him and that he will regain his sight. Okay. But Ananias replied, Lord, I have heard from many sources about this man what evil things he has done to your holy ones in Jerusalem. Again, the word holy ones also referred to the believers, okay, to, to all those who believe in the Lord. And here he has authority from the chief priests to imprison all who call upon your name. So he has a warrant of arrest. Okay? But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites, and I will show him what he will have to suffer for my name. So this is the vocation. This is a calling. This man is a chosen, meaning he was called instrument. So that is his vocation. What? To carry my name, to share his name to share the good news to whom? To the Gentiles, to the kings, and to the other Israelites. Okay? And also, it is prophesied that he will have to suffer. Okay? This is what it meant. That was his calling, his vocation, and a prophecy that he too, soul, will suffer. So Ananias went and entered the house, laid his hands on him, and said, Soul, my brother... The Lord has sent me. Jesus appeared to you on the way by which you came, that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, things like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. He got up 
and was baptized. And when he had eaten, he recovered his strength. So, okay. What happened here? So he regained his sight and uh, received the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it was um, Saul regained his physical sight, but also acquired a true spiritual vision of Christ. So while we say that he, he regained his sight physically, but this event of his made him also gain spiritual vision of Jesus Christ. The falling down of the scales, recall what happened in the Old Testament, um, uh, also of uh, the temporary blindness of Tobit in the Old Testament. Okay? So after three days of prayer and fasting, he was baptized. So immediately he stayed home. He stayed home some days with the disciples in Damascus. And he began at once, what? Now, to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, okay, that he is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Son of God. So you see the turn of events? He now, instead of preaching against the Christians, against the believers, he is now the one proclaiming about the Son of God. And all who heard him were astounded and said, Is not this the man? who in Jerusalem ravaged those who call upon this name and came here expressly to take them back in chains to the chief priest. But Saul grew all the stronger and confounded the Jews who live in Damascus, proving that this is the Messiah. Okay. So we see here how Paul, or how Saul, um, uh, was converted. Okay. This is his conversion experience and how he received his vocation and his calling from Jesus himself. Okay, Now, let's continue. After a long time had passed, you know how long is this? This is three years. Okay, So this is three years. Um, how do I know that it's three years? Because uh, it's written in the in his letter to the second letter to the Corinthians, wherein he mentioned that uh, even the governor of Damascus plotted against him. The the Jews were hostile against him. Why? Because you know instead of instead of condemning the the followers, the believers, he was converting them into Christianity. So uh, even. Even the governor of Damascus plotted against him. All this is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So that's why I knew. Um, Paul spent three years uh, in Arabia okay, before going to Jerusalem. Okay. But there, so he spent three years before going to Jerusalem. So what would have been, he been doing in, Jerus in, in Arabia? Okay. Because... Uh, I'm sure he's learning about the faith, you know, because that's a question. Where did Paul, where did Saul learn the faith? If, he, if Jesus just appeared to him, how come he knew a lot of things? And later on, you know, wrote letters to different communities. In those three years, I'm sure he was learning also about the faith. So, okay. Um, now, so what happened? Uh, the Jews conspired to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. Now they were keeping watch on the gates, day and night, so as to kill him. But the disciples took him one night and let him down through an opening of the wall, lowering him in a basket. Can you imagine? Okay, he's being lowered in a basket. Okay, when he arrived in Jerusalem, wow, now he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Okay, because they knew he was a you know, persecutor of Christians. But then Barabbas, oh no, Barnabas, sorry, Barnabas, remember Barnabas, the one who became a follower, who sold all his possessions and placed his, the, the earnings, all the one, all that he earned, the, 
to the foot of the apostles, that was uh, in our earlier passages, chapters. Then Barnabas took charge of him and brought him to the apostles. And who are these apostles? These are Peter and James. Peter and James. How do I know it? It's in Galatians, chapter 1, 18 to 19, that uh, Paul was writing about his visit to Jerusalem when he met not all the apostles, but Peter and James. Not actually not the apostle James, but James known to be the, the, the brother of the Lord. Okay, James, the brother of the Lord. So anyway, um, so he was brought to the apostles and he reported to them how on the way he had seen the Lord and that he had spoken to him. Okay, so he, he narrated what uh, happened, okay, his conversion story. Okay, and how in Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. He moved about freely with them in Jerusalem and spoke out boldly in the name of the Lord. He also spoke and debated with the Hellenists. Who are these Hellenists? These are the people who, who stoned uh, Stephen. Okay, but they tried to kill him. Okay, and when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him on his way to Tarsus. What is Tarsus? Tarsus is Saul's birthplace. Okay. Uh, and so he stayed in Tarsus. That's why we, we address Paul as Paul of Tarsus because he was born in Tarsus. Okay. So, um, so let's just go on. Verse 31. The church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria was at peace. It was being built up and walked in the fear of the Lord and with the consolation of the Holy Spirit, it grew in numbers. So we see here now how the, the faith was spreading throughout Judea and Samaria. Okay, some points of reflection in this conversion of soul. So I would like to offer you four points of reflection um, regarding this uh, uh, conversion of soul. First, Christ and the Christian's so we see here Christ lives in the Christians. Remember in Matthew 25, uh, whatsoever you do to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. So we see here the connection, the association of Christ and his body, the church, our connection. So who was Saul persecuting? Not just the Christians, but Christ himself. Now, the second point is the conversion of Saul from a persecutor of Christians to Paul, the preacher of the good news. And what brought about this one? His encounter with Jesus. His personal encounter with Jesus. And probably this is one thing that we ask ourselves. What is your encounter of Jesus? What is the story of your personal conversion? You know, this story of souls of Paul's conversion became his very effective, powerful tool for evangelization. Because for him, it was a personal witnessing. Just as Peter and the apostles, when they spoke, they were not teaching high dogmatic, uh, you know, theories or what. They were telling the people what they saw, what they heard. They were witnesses, witnessing. So maybe that is also one thing that we examine ourselves and ask ourselves, how do we give witness to the Lord? What is your personal conversion story? What is your experience of Jesus. And that will be a very powerful tool of yours in sharing the faith with others. That's a good news, right? So number three, so even though Jesus called him directly, called Paul directly, he needed to be baptized and be introduced into the Christian community. Okay, don't think that there is a shortcut that, oh, as long as I'm called, I don't need to be baptized. Uh, the need for baptism is really important, okay? And number 
for reflection that I would like to uh, propose to you is that all this happened in the context of prayer. Um, often in prayer, we discover God's plan. Okay, We may have our own plans, our own priorities, our own uh, projects. But in prayer, God presents his plan to us. He changes our plans. That's why we heard here how uh, Paul or Saul was praying, right? So when uh, Saul was praying when uh, he was given that vision of Ananias. Okay, prayer and fasting, right? So those are some points that we could uh, possibly reflect on. Now let's continue. Now let's go back to Peter. Uh, two things that happened here, let's read. As Peter was passing through every region, he went down to the Holy Ones living in Lida. There he found a man named Aeneas, who had been confined to bed for eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, um, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. He got up at once, and all the inhabitants of Lida and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Okay? So, um, what do we see here? Um, uh, Aeneas, who was uh, sick for eight years, paralyzed. Peter told him, Jesus Christ heals you. Okay? So, we see here how Jesus was working through Peter and unleashes the same healing power. You know, just as Jesus was healing during the, his time, during his ministry, this same ministry of healing and his power is seen in the ministry of the apostles. And it ended up with conversion, faith and conversion. Verse 35, and all the inhabitants of Lida and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. So we see here the effect. This is not just for uh, a show, right? It's not just to perform something to to prove something, but it is for conversion. So whenever we encounter miracles in our lives, it is also a call to convert, a call for us to have faith in the Lord. And then another event that followed. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. Okay? She was completely occupied with good deeds and almsgiving. So she, she's a good, good person. huh? Now, during those days, she fell sick and died. So after washing her, they laid out in a room upstairs. They laid her out in a room upstairs. Washing her means preparing her for burial. Okay. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went, went with them. When he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs where all the widows came to him, weeping and showing him the tunics and cloaks that Dor Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. Then he turned to her body and said, Tabitha, rise up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hands and raised her up. And when he had called the holy ones, again the believers, and the widows, he presented her alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many came to believe in the Lord. And he stayed a long time in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. Okay, so... Again, there's another miracle here, and this time it is uh, raising the dead to life. Okay, as again, it goes back to reflect uh, or to points to what Jesus had done to the daughter of Jairus. Remember in Mark, is that in Mark? Mark chapter 5, that um, uh, Jesus went to the room of that. Uh, of the daughter of Jairus and, you know, raised her up from the dead. So also it uh, recalls the uh, raising up of, uh, of, of uh, the son of the widow by Elijah 
in 1 Kings, in the first book of Kings, chapter 17. Okay? It was also in the upper room when that happened. And Elijah also prayed for that son of the widow. Okay? The same thing with what, with what Peter did. Uh, it was in the upper room and um, upper room of the house and uh, Peter prayed over her body and she was raised. So again, with this, okay, with this, what happened? Um, verse 42, this became known all over Joppa and many came to believe in the Lord. Again, it brings forth uh, faith and conversion. So why am I saying this? Why, why are these stories here? Because it showed us how the faith continued to spread. That's why I told you in the book, in this book of the Acts of the Apostles, it is uh, actually the start, the birth and growth of the church. So all this brought about the growth of the church. Okay. Now, let's continue. Now, maybe you are... Uh, what's the significance of speaking of, of staying in the house of Simon the Tanner? Okay. Um, we might just take this for granted, but this is significant because Simon, who offered to host Peter, you know, Simon the Tanner, okay, who offered uh, to host Peter, is in a perpetual uncleanness according to Levitical laws. Okay, in Levitical, in the book of Leviticus chapter 5, it specified that if you come always in contact with animal skin or carcasses, you become unclean. And Simon, because of his job as a tanner, is always unclean. Right? Now, Peter, by um, by staying with him, with him, uh, brings out a certain openness, or this is, this actually anticipates uh, what he will discover that uh, no one is actually or should should be considered unclean. So this sets the stage. His stay, his stay in the house of Simon the Tanner, sets the stage for the inauguration of the Gentile mission. Okay, inaugurates the Gentile mission. Now let's go to the inauguration of the Gentile mission. So um, the vision of Cornelius, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing here. So let's read it and then I'll give a quick explanation. Okay. Now in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the cohort called the Italica. Italica. Okay. Caesarea, as I mentioned a while ago, is the capital, is a Roman capital of Judea. And Cornelius is a centurion, a Roman uh, commander who leads around 100 Roman soldiers. Okay, Now, he was devout and God-fearing along with his whole household, who used to give alms generously to the Jewish people and pray to God constantly. Oh, see? Again, like like uh, the one we mentioned a while ago, uh, who was that? The eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, right? This time, this is Cornelius, who was also, you know, uh, who also is God fearing. Meaning, he he though he may be a Gentile, he admired the God of Israel, and he worships. He follows the teachings, especially this uh, alms giving and prayer. Because these are very basic in the tradition of the Jews, okay, in their practice of their faith, okay. So, but the only thing that holds him back from being part of the family of Israelites is he's a Gentile, okay. Now, let's look into what happened. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he saw plainly in a vision an angel of God come into him. And say to him, Cornelius. He looked intently at him and, and seized with fear, said, what is, what is it, sir? 
He said to him, Your prayers and almsgiving have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Wow. Now send some man to Joppa and summon one Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with another Simon, a tanner, who has a house by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from his staff, explained everything to them and sent them to Joppa. Okay, so I'll just give you a little uh, explanation here. So again, it is the angel of the Lord who moved. Okay, it's the angel of the Lord who initiated the move. And he was praying at 3 o'clock. What's the significance? 3 o'clock is like, 3 o'clock in the afternoon was like for the Jews a time of prayer in the temple. And they offer a sacrifice. They offer sacrifice. Uh, that is what we call the cereal offering, okay, uh, at 3 o'clock. So this is a traditional time of prayer and offers sacrifices. Okay, so the angel appeared, okay. The angel appeared to him, okay. Um, and what did the angel say? Your prayers and almsgiving have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Oh, see? People who offer prayers and almsgiving is like a sacrifice that is that ascends to God. Okay? You see how important it is for us to do almsgiving and prayer. Okay? In the in the church teachings, in the Jewish tradition and even in our teachings of the church. Right? Even in our teachings today, our almsgiving, if we do it well, right, if we do it properly, you know, this will help us for our eternity. Okay? Uh, God sees the goodness of our hearts. So uh, it is offered like the ones that are offered in the temple. That is what it is meant here. Okay, so he was asked to go look for Peter, okay, Simon Peter in the house of Simon the Tanner. So he ordered two men to do that. Now, let's read on. The next day, while they were on their way and nearing the city, Peter went up the roof to pray at about noontime. Well, he was hungry and wished to eat. And while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. He fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something resembling a large sheet coming down, lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all the earth's four-legged animals and reptiles and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. But Peter said, Certainly not, sir, for never have I eaten anything profane and unclean. The voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has made clean, you are not to call Profane. This happened three times, and then uh, the object was taken up into the sky. Okay, what is this vision all about? So Peter was again in the moment of prayer. Cornelius was also, when the angel of the Lord appeared to him, was in the moment of prayer. You see how prayers are so important. So he went into a trance as if he had a vision a vision coming from the Lord, okay? A vision coming from, from God, okay? So he, he had this trance. And the vision was animal, all sorts of animals were presented to him. And he was asked to eat them, okay? Peter, being a faithful Jew, would not eat the unclean animals. Remember, again, in Leviticus chapter 11, there were... Uh, they distinguish what were the clean animals and unclean animals. Okay, what does this vision teach Peter? Okay, it, this vision teaches him, uh, when, 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 when God said, for, uh, or when the angel said, certainly not, uh, when, when, the, uh, when the angel told him, what God has made clean, you are not to call profane. What God has made clean, you are not to call it profane. So what does this vision teach Peter? 
Okay. That the dietary laws of Moses had been lifted. You don't anymore distinguish clean, unclean foods. That in the new covenant, in this in following Jesus, this new covenant has lifted this old mosaic law regarding food restrictions. And what is the implication here? Okay. Um, this food law is an allegory of their moral and uh, religious distinction between Israel who is clean and Gentiles unclean. That was maintained in the Old Covenant. So, by lifting this law, the message is now nobody, also, also no, no one is to be considered unclean. Everyone in the New Covenant, in the, in, in the relationship with God, in the relationship with Jesus, Gentiles are no longer banned from full and equal acceptance into the Covenant. So this is the message of this vision. Okay? So just to, just to explain again, because the background is very much in the Old Testament. Okay? The law of unclean and clean. There are food that are unclean, which they should not eat. There are food that are clean that they can eat. The Israelites consider themselves clean and so should not associate themselves with the Gentiles who are considered unclean. So with this vision where the angel said, what God okay, has considered clean, do not call it profane. So it tells us, it tells, it told Peter, right? It, the message to Peter was that this time everyone is clean. No one should be considered unclean. Okay? No Gentile should be considered unclean. And, clean. and they are also welcome into the family of God. They are welcome into the family of Jesus. That's the message. Okay. So while Peter, let's continue on. While Peter was in doubt about the meaning of the vision he had seen, the man sent by Cornelius asked for Simon's house and arrived at the entrance. They called out inquiring whether Simon, who is called Peter, was staying there. As Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, There are three men here looking for you, so get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without hesitation, because I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the man and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your being here? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, respected by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in and showed them hospitality. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of, them, some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. On the following day, he entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, falling at his feet, paid him homage. Peter, however, raised him up, saying, Get up, I myself am also a human being. Okay, so here, what did Cornelius do? He fell down to his feet. That is an act of worship. So Peter asked him, Hey, 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 no, 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 I'm but human. You don't worship any other human. You only worship God, okay? So you, we may give honor, we may venerate, we may respect other human beings, but we never worship other human beings. So by falling down to the feet of Peter, Cornelius was like worshiping. That's why Peter said, hey, get up. I myself am also a human being. While he con conversed with him, he went in and found many people gathered together and said to them, you know that it is unlawful for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call any person profane or unclean. And that is why I came without objection when sent for. May I ask then, why you summoned me? Okay, you see there, Peter already realized the message. Okay, 
Cornelius replied, Four days ago at this hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, I was at prayer in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling robes stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your almsgiving remembered before God. Uh, you see, prayer and almsgiving. Send therefore to Joppa and summon Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you were kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to listen to all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Okay, so they shared their uh, respective experience, like Peter saying, I, am, I it was shown to me, I realized this. And then Cornelius was saying, this was, uh, I was, the angel also told me about this. So we see here, but all this is the work of God. Huh? All this is initiated by God. And it is done, again, in the context of prayer. In the context of prayer. Okay. Now, um, can we just finish this first portion of, okay? Then Peter proceeded to speak and said, In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. God shows no favoritism, no partiality, just to one nation. Or you might say, oh, Father, uh, in the Old Testament, the chosen people is only Israel. But what is Peter saying here? Remember the blessing, remember the covenant of God to Abraham that um, he did, Israel will be his chosen people, okay, but through them, all nations will be blessed. It, God never uh, said that you will be the only nation for me. Okay? God chose Israel as the first son, firstborn, so that everyone else, all other nations, will be blessed. That is why Peter said, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. Okay? So you know the word that he sent to Israelites as he proclaimed peace to Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. What has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all the people but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness uh, of sins through his name. So, again, once again, Peter gave his kerygma, the proclamation of the good news. He started with the baptism of John. Started with the baptism of John until the um, until the commissioning of Jesus to spread the good news. Then he he mentioned about this. He witnessed. So this is Peter's proclamation of the good news. Actually, this is also um, we could say what the Gospel of Mark is all about from the Gospel of John until the, pro the commissioning to proclaim the good news, okay? So this is similar to, that, to the gospel of, uh, gospel of Mark, by the way, not John, Gospel of Mark. So um, Peter um, proclaimed the good news, okay? And then what happened? Take note, this is a very beautiful uh, um, event. While Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who are listening to the word. The circumcised believers who had accompanied Peter 
were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit should have been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they could hear them speaking in tongues and glorifying God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit even as we have? As we have? He ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for a few days. What did we just hear? The Pentecost experience of the Gentiles. So we just heard here the Pentecost experience. Remember in the first Pentecost, Peter went out to the people and started speaking, right? When they spoke, well, first the Holy Spirit descended on them. He went out and spoke to them. And then they were like speaking in tongues, right? And the people were baptized. The same thing here. Peter spoke to them. The Holy Spirit descended upon the Gentiles. See? It was the Holy Spirit who, who fell upon these people, these Gentiles. And they were speaking in tongues. Okay? And they were baptized. They were called for baptism. So this is the Pentecost experience of the Gentiles. And we see here the inauguration of the mission among the Gentiles. So salvation is not just for the Jews, not just for the Israelites, but salvation is for all. So it's beautiful, very beautiful to see how the church, you know, developed, how the church grew. First, focusing all their attention to the Jews to tell them, hey, the fulfillment of all the prophecies in the Old Testament was in Jesus. Now, the gift of faith, the gift of new life, the gift of being part of God's family is extended even to the Gentiles. And um, so what can we learn? The mission, the mission to evangelize everyone. We should not and must not marginalize anyone in the work of evangelization. Probably nowadays you don't, we don't uh, uh, distinguish between Gentiles, you know, or chosen one. But at times we still have those distinctions. Oh, these are, these are homeless. These are poor people, oh, these are homosexuals that we tend at times to, you know, marginalize or put aside in the work of evangelization where in fact the good news is for everybody. And this is a challenge for us. We evangelize not just our friends. Let us evangelize including our enemies. Let us also evangelize people whom we think uh, or whom we consider who does not belong because they do belong to the family of God. And so, uh, again, we see here the work of God, how the angel of the Lord, how the Holy Spirit, the, initiation, the, the initiative of God, right, in, the, in all this work. And at the same time, the importance of the context of prayer wherein we discover what God wants in prayer. You know, because many times when we say prayer, uh, we tell God what we want, right? But the prayer should be a moment wherein we discover what God wants for us. Okay? And also, uh, the third, is, the third uh, reflection here is for all. Uh, the work of God is for all. So, I will end here. Next week, we will begin with chapter 11. We will see the reaction. Oh, the Israelites, those, uh, you know, those, uh, uh, um, how do you call that? Those loyal or those uh, um, uh, Israelites, how they reacted to the baptism of the Gentiles. 
I think I know I know how you how, how I think I know what you're thinking. But uh, what they did, what 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 was the reaction? So that is what we will be looking at for next week, and also um, the spread of the persecution also. Okay. So thank you for joining us today. I hope uh, our Bible study today uh, enlightened you more. You know um, about. Uh, Philip and the uh, Ethiopian uh, eunuch, how the need for scriptures to be read properly and how uh, he accepted, how, again, the idea that everyone who have not been counted is actually included in the new covenant. We saw how Paul, who Saul was converted into Paul. Okay, we saw his conversion experience. And we saw also the inauguration of the Gentile mission, first and foremost with Cornelius. Three very crucial events or very important events in the history of the church that shape what the church is today. So thank you for joining. Any questions, please just post them. I can answer them uh, probably for, I can look at them next week. Any suggestions and uh, questions, please uh, be open or please feel free to ask. So thank you, thank you very much for joining us today. See you again next week, uh, same Facebook page and same time from 7 to around 8.15. Thank you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And also, we, we ask Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much.